Well, hello and welcome folks. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to see you all and I'm so happy to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change our world. The heart of the National Geographic community is of course our explorers. National Geographic explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers, powerful storytellers. They're adventurers, filmmakers, photographers, and, and just all around amazing people. And these Explorer Classroom events connect students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, in addition to all of our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow for some more Explorer Classroom. But for today, we're very, very lucky to be connecting with Imogen Knapper. Imogen's a marine scientist who specializes in investigating unexpected sources of plastic in the ocean, like facial scrubs, washing your clothes, and biodegradable plastics. We're going to learn all about her research and the unexpected hidden plastics that may be lurking in our lives. But before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several student groups today, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more of you registered to participate. I'm so glad to have so many students out there today. Today, our students are representing Alabama, Arizona, California, Colorado, the District of Columbia, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Iowa, Idaho, Illinois, Ohio, Oregon, Massachusetts, Maryland, North Carolina, New Mexico, Nevada, New York, New Jersey, South Carolina, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and Wyoming, plus Canada, Egypt, Ireland, Peru, Romania, and the United Kingdom. It's lovely to have you all here, students, but it's not just students out there, it's also educators. This week happens to be Educator Appreciation Week. Thank you so much to all of the teachers out there. Your work has never been more important or more apparent. So this Teacher Appreciation Week, we're here at National Geographic to say that we see you and we thank you for your work. You do so much every day for all your students, for your fellow educators and for your communities. Um, so from everyone at National Geographic Society, thank you so much. We're proud to support you. And today, because it's Teacher Appreciation Week, I wanna give all of my shout outs to teachers. I invite you to do the same in the chat bar. If there's a special teacher in your life, go ahead and send a little message and we'll give them a shout out later on in the event. But to start, we've got shout outs for the pack leader of Cub Scout Pack 420. We've got the teachers at Englewood Middle, the field school teachers, everyone at Monroe Elementary, Muscatine High School teachers, Orchard Ranch Elementary, St. Peter and Paul School, Summerwind Elementary, West Park Place Elementary School, Miss Baumgartner, Miss Baden, Miss Crothwaite, uh, Miss Andrews, Miss Mister, excuse me, McCabe, Miss Hungerford, Mister Henwood, Mister Fratella, Mister Keegan, Miss Hatinga, Miss Hansen, Miss Faddock, Miss Kimball, Miss Reynolds, Miss Rose, and Mrs. Barlow. And with those shout outs out of the way, it's finally time for me to turn it over to Imogen for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Hi everyone and good evening from the United Kingdom. Hope all you're, you're all keeping well and I'm going to be talking to you all today about how to be a plastic detective. So I hope you're ready to learn exactly the skills that you need to be a plastic detective. I'm just going to share my screen and just shout if you can't see it. So hopefully you're now seeing my screen, perfect. So I'm a marine scientist and I specialize in looking at plastic pollution and how it's getting into our environment. How is it getting into the ocean? And my research is all about investigating the not so obvious. But I want to start with exactly what is a plastic. And I think it's something that we all just need to remind ourselves of every now and then. So I want you to see this Lego brick and next to the Lego brick there's a monomer and it's got carbon and hydrogen. This is the most basic simple structure of a plastic. If we put all of those carbon and hydrogens together, all of those Lego bricks, that forms plastic. And this plastic can come in so many different wonderful shapes and forms that benefit our lives. And if you look around the room that you're in, I'm sure you can see plastic everywhere. I've got a plastic bottle. I've, behind me, I've got a plastic surfboard. I'm on a plastic chair. So it's really revolutionized our lives for the better. 
But where did it all begin? So the first synthetic plastic was made about 100 years ago in 1907, and it was a plastic called Bakelite. And a few of you, maybe the, the older generation, might remember Bakelite radios. And my Nana still has a Bakelite radio today. And that suddenly boomed the whole plastic age. So we have the Iron Age, the Stone Age, but now you could say that we are in the plastics age. And all of these different plastics have been made since then. So we've had polystyrene in 1929, used to make uh, the cups that you get in a takeaway cup. Polyester in 1930, that's commonly used to make our clothes. To prove a point, my jumper is actually polyester. PVC, polyvinyl chloride, used to make pipes. Polythene in 1930, used to make bottles and water bottles. And nylon, that's made the bristles of our toothbrush. So as you can see, plastic is such a great material, but unfortunately it's how we use it and how it's such a single use item that sometimes can cause issues. And it's the single use items, like I've just said, that can be the most troublesome. But back then, around the 1940s, people thought that it was just such a big solution. And as you can see here, it's a Life magazine where they're chucking all of their single use plastics in the air. And if you look closely, you'll see some items that you recognize, such as plates or forks or spoons. And that's because we thought it was such an exciting time where it would just, we wouldn't have to do any chores. We wouldn't have to wash the dishes. We could all just chuck it away. But now it's coming back to bite us because unfortunately it's accumulating, it's building up in our environment. So where did it all begin for me? Well, this is a picture of me and my dad when I was about three years old, and I used to love the ocean and love the sea. I grew up in a small seaside town called Clevedon, which is in the southwest of the UK. And I used to go to the beach, look at the ocean, and I could just stay there for hours and hours. And I used to love drawing in the sand. I draw different pictures of animals, of buildings, of planes. And my parents said it was the best babysitting service ever but I never remember there being any plastic there. Because if there was, I would have used it as my paintbrush to draw in the sand. Fast forward 20 or 30 so years, and when I go back to the same beaches, or to the beaches near me, unfortunately, this is what I see. Plastic everywhere, like confetti on the sand. Um, this is me when I was doing a walk on an Easter Sunday. You can see my cheeky little dog, Rhubarb, who's in the top right, the black and white Springer Spaniel. And I just went to the beach just to have a walk. And I was so surprised to see all of this plastic there. So this has happened in my lifetime in 30 years. I remember there being clean sand. And now, unfortunately, I'm seeing the sand that's covered in plastic. And it's showing how polluted our oceans can become. But I wanted to be part of the solution. I wanted to see how I can make a difference. And that's why I was able to churn this curiosity of where it's coming from into research. And now I'm a marine scientist focusing on plastic pollution into the ocean. And you might think of the different sources of plastic into the ocean from litter dropped at the beach or poorly managed industries or sewage related debris. But I really wanted to investigate the plastic that people hadn't typically thought of. Someone's best described me as a plastic detective. My first research was looking at microbeads in facial scrubs. Now, microbeads used to be put in facial scrubs because they're exfoliating, they're very harsh, so it'd get the dead skin off, so your skin would feel really smooth. Unfortunately, when you wash your face, these microbeads, these tiny plastic particles, would then go down the drain, potentially through the sewage treatment works, and then into our ocean. I want to investigate how many tiny plastic microbeads could be in one bottle. That's exactly what I decided to do. And as you can see here, it's quite a scary image actually. The glass files in front of the facial scrub shows how much plastic was in one bottle. And our research was able to show that up to 3 million tiny microbeads could be in one facial scrub. So 10,000 on the squirt of your hand, which you then wash your face and then these would go down the drain. However, it shows you how research can make such a positive change. We were able to share this research around the world and to governments and to most importantly, people like you and me, because we can make a choice in what we're buying and choose natural uh, alternatives instead, and then 
the research influenced governments around the world to ban microbeads. So it was my first research piece and I was so delighted to see that I can make a huge change from it. And it's exactly what you guys can do too as plastic detectives. My next piece of research was looking at washing our clothes. And like I said, a lot of our clothes are made out of plastic. That's because it's quite cheap. But when we're washing our clothes and they're swishing and swirling around in the washing machine, tiny plastic fibers can come off and then potentially get into the wastewater. Like the micro beads, then going through the wastewater and then potentially into the ocean. So this was my partner in crime for about seven months and I did over 200 hours of washing clothes. We decided to wash polyester, acrylic and polyester cotton jumpers for our experiment. That's common items that we're likely to get when we're shopping. But what did we find? Well, we found for a six kilogram wash, which is about the average in the UK, if I was to wash polyester cotton blend clothes, about 130,000 fibres would come off. For polyester, more with 500,000 fibres, and for acrylic, the most at 700,000 fibres. So every time you're washing your clothes, 700,000 fibres could come off and potentially make its way into the ocean. Then looking at my next piece of research, I looked at biodegradable and compostable plastics. I was really curious to see if they would actually break down in a quick time frame in the natural environment. So how did I test this? Well, I looked at different biodegradable and compostable carrier bags. You can see them here. We also tested a normal conventional carrier bag that didn't claim uh, to break down quickly. And I cut these all into strips, so they were standard strips. And I then sewed them into different meshes. When I sewed them into the meshes, I then put them in three different environments. So I buried them in the soil. There you go, you can see all the strips. I also put uh, whole bags there because it's easier to see and it's good for media. I left them outside, hung up, getting the sunlight. You can see our contraption there. And that one went into the ocean uh, in, a, in a pontoon next to the boats. So we had outside the soil and also the ocean. And what did we do? Well, we left them out there for three whole years. And every nine months, I would take samples to see if they were still there, if they had disappeared, just to see what had happened. And what did I find? Well. After three years, the samples in the ocean had loads of wonderful critters and animals on there. You can see lots of sea squirts and crabs and also some starfish. But what did we find? Well, so well, the ones that were in the air, they had broken up into tiny pieces and that was for all of the bags. And that's caused plastic breaks down by something called photooxidization, where it introduces an oxygen molecule into the carbon and hydrogens that we talked about earlier, and that breaks up the molecule. It doesn't mean it's disappearing, it just means it's fragmenting. And you could say that these fragments are worse because they're harder to pick up. How about the ones in the soil and the ocean? Well, they were still there after three years. The compostable bag in the ocean did disappear, but all of the biodegradable bags were still there. And what was really surprising is that they could still hold a full bag of shopping. I don't know about you, when I hear the word biodegradable, I think of it like an apple, it will break down in a matter of weeks or months, but not years. I'm not saying that biodegradable and compostable isn't a solution, but it needs to go into the right framework for it to be properly disposed of and not the natural environment. And it was a pretty heavy bag that we tested as well, full of baked beans, we had some bananas, some pasta, and also some cereal. But all of this research uh, has been really exciting and it's really shown me how we can make an effective change from science. But the best thing has been seeing the response from people like you and me and how we can make small changes in our lives uh, to better the planet. I'm now working with Scottish and Rescue and National Geographic, continuing my washing machine work to test different inventions that try and capture the fibres in the washing cycle. And I have some very exciting results that are about to come out and I'm really excited to share them with you soon because it could be the future of washing our clothes. And then quickly to finish, I'm also really delighted to be on the National Geographic Sea to Source expedition. And I've been looking at the results today and uh, again, we've got some very interesting, exciting results to share. Um, I've got a whole complete diverse team that I work with uh, and they're absolutely incredible from socioeconomic people to land-based scientists, 
and it's also a water-based team. And we've gone on the Ganges from sea to source to understand how plastic is getting into the river and most importantly what are the solutions that we can do and input to make it better. And I want to end on a positive. This is a, a mosquito that's made for my friend Rob Arnold in Cornwall. And as you can see, it's got an inhaler, a bit of a bottle, cotton bud sticks, and it comes with this really important message. If you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm really excited to answer your questions. Imogen, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I think so many times we stop thinking about things as soon as they hit our trash cans, but what a great way to remind us about how our everyday choices, big and small, can impact our environment in, in really unexpected and really powerful ways. For folks learning along at home, I'd love to know what you found most interesting about this. If you do a follow-up activity from our family guide, we would love to see it. Maybe you draw a picture or write a news article or make a video, whatever it is, please send it to us on Twitter at Nat Geo Education with hashtag Explore Classroom. That way we can make sure Imogen gets a chance to see all of your amazing work. But now it's time for questions, our favorite time of the day. If you're watching online, send us your questions in the chat bar. If you're up on screen with me, get ready with a nice loud voice. I'll let you know when it's your turn. We had some shout outs for teachers coming in the chat bar. So big shout outs to Mrs. McDonald, Ms. Mateno, Ms. Holly, Mr. Rucker, Mrs. Ebert, Ms. Hallbeck, Ms. O'Gorman, Ms. Zapata, and Mr. Fratella. Your students want to thank you for all that you do. We think you're wonderful. Um, and one more note about that chat bar. If you're sending something in, you only need to send it one time. We keep track of everything as it comes in. So please just send it once. Our first question came to us from Janet who's wondering if there's somewhere you'd recommend students go for further reading after this. Do you have a favorite source that you could send them to? Oh, a favorite source. Well, I know actually National Geographic Education has some amazing plastic resources and uh, actually feature in some of the videos. Uh, so we could definitely link you. Um, I'll put you in the right direction to there. Awesome. And then Nunez, I Nunez 214 one nine fun username is wondering if the chemicals in the air are affecting the plastic um or is it just plastic affecting the ocean uh so actually i've been doing a bit of research looking at plastics in the air because even as i'm sat here and i'm wearing a plastic jumper i have a friend that's actually done research to show that the fibers are coming off your clothes when you're moving so plastics in the air is uh, definitely a a source of pollution that's getting a lot of interest at the moment and plastic does have chemicals in it so that's how you could say that uh, plastic and chemicals are in the air but I wouldn't say it's anything to be concerned about uh, we're breathing it in all the time and breathing it out uh, and it's a, going to be a very interesting source of research in the next few months. Brilliant well let's go to Samara who's up on screen with us for our next question. Samara your microphone's on. So I heard something about um the plastic island in the Pacific or I don't know where, but how big is it? Ah, okay, I know the plastic islands and there's so many different ways that you can describe it. Uh, it's basically gyres um, and it's where all of the plastic accumulates because of the circular currents and also the wind patterns. So imagine it's just being pushed in into one place. It's not an island you can stand on. Um, it's just unfortunately a place where a lot of the plastic is ending up. I've heard it's as big as France, as big as Texas, uh, so I, I don't know exactly how big it is, but I do know it's definitely a, a scarily big area and that's why we need to stop plastic from getting in the ocean. Brilliant. On the same theme of, of sizes, Imogen, we've got some people wondering how big and how small are the plastics that you're normally finding? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm actually, oh, I, w I weirdly have a bottle that I can uh, show you. So we have microplastics and also macroplastics. So macroplastics are bigger than five millimeters. So imagine a bottle, but then we have microplastics. Uh, microplastics are smaller than five millimeters. So that's really small stuff. And this is the stuff that we don't typically see. And you can get two sources of microplastics. You get primary microplastics. So imagine 
the micro beads and facial scrubs, they've been made to be that size, that small size to get our um, rub on our skin and get the dead skin off. Or you can get secondary microplastics. And secondary microplastics come off bigger bits of plastic. So if you can see my bottle here, you, it's been in the sun, I got it on a beach clean, but you can see it's really fragmenty. I could almost pull off bits. So these bits that I'd be pulling off are microplastics, but from a secondary source. Super cool. We've got Nico, Brian, Elizabeth, and many, many more who are wondering if you could talk a little bit about how plastics are hurting animals. So we know about the different sizes of plastics. We have the bigger bits, the macro plastic, and these are troublesome in the ocean because it can cause entanglement. So imagine if you got stuck in a net. Um, it can also uh, hit, well, it's not for animals, but it can hit boats, it can hit ships, and that can maybe make it unsafe for people. But it's the smaller bits, the bits that I'm really interested in as well, that can be ingested. So imagine if you're a tiny plankton and you've just eaten a microplastic or a microbead, and then a fish comes and eats that plankton, then a bigger fish comes and eats that fish, it can actually go up the food chain. So I say ingestion is a a growing part of research and something that we need to investigate more. Brilliant. Well, let's go to Matthew for our next question. Matthew's up on screen with us. Your Has, microphone's on. Have someone ever invented something by using the trash in the ocean to help stop it? Has someone ever invented something to stop the trash from going in the ocean? Yeah, by using the trash in the ocean already. Hmm, it's a really good question. I have heard of scientists that have been using plastic waste and waste found in landfill sites to then make energy, to then make new plastic. Um, but it depends how creative you are. I've heard that people are collecting waste from the beaches and the ocean to make art. Um, which is really effective and it's really a powerful message. But what we really need to focus on is the plastic to stop getting in the ocean in the first place. I've heard a really good example, which is like an overfilling bath. Um, what we need to do is just turn off the tap. We don't need to keep mopping up the floor. We just need to turn off the tap. Brilliant. We've got Priscilla and Marina wondering if there's a best or worst kind of plastic. Hmm. So in my personal opinion, I would say that the best plastic is the plastic that's the most durable. I keep pointing at my water bottles because I have it all the time. I'm probably going to have this water bottle for my whole life. It's not a single use plastic. It's a really durable plastic that I'll, I carry everywhere with me. So I'd say the really durable hard plastic is great. And also plastic that is recyclable. So if I do have to get a single use plastic, because we all do, uh, then it can be recycled and then made into a new plastic item afterwards. Amazing. Um, Subash Jane online is wondering, they've read something about how there's some worms and maybe some fungus and some other things that might be able to eat plastic. Do you know of anyone studying um, natural solutions like that? Yeah, it's, it's actually really interesting. And I, I've, I know some of the scientists that are studying it. Uh, I've heard of worms, uh, bacteria, um, and it's definitely a potential solution, but the conditions have to be so ideal. It has to be the right temperature. Uh, it has to be the right uh, pH. So whether it has to be alkaline or acidic, uh, there's so many different elements to it. What kind of plastic could it attack? Will it be affected by different chemicals? So it is a solution, but we need to understand in what environments will it work. And it's most likely to be in the waste environment. Catherine is wondering what the difference between something being biodegradable and something being compostable is. So I get this question a lot and I'm gonna explain it the way that, that I think of it. When I think of compostable, I assume that I can put it in the compost bin like an apple and it will disappear. And biodegradable, can be broken down by bacteria or other natural processes. Um, 
You can get different types of compostable and biodegradable, and that's why we need the proper standards and education so that they can get in the right waste streams so we can properly dispose of them. Brilliant. Let's go to Daniel and Sarah for our next question. Your microphone's on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you ever found a, a case phone on the, in the sea? Uh, have I ever found a what in the sea, sorry? Uh, case, a uh, phone case. A phone case. A phone case? I can't say I have. I found lots of other strange things. Lots of flip-flops, uh, toothbrushes. Um, gosh, I'm sure some people have found some phone cases. I know of a company that actually makes phone cases out of plastic waste. So that's like a full circle. Awesome. We've got a bunch of people who were really surprised that plastics are in our clothing. Um, that was news to them in your presentation. Are there other really unexpected places that you found plastic, Imogen? After this, have a look around your house and you'll be really surprised to know how much plastic there is in our lifestyles. And that's because it's an amazing material, um, but we just need to be careful of how we dispose of it. Um, looking around my, the room I'm in, I've got a plastic carpet. So I'm standing on plastic, sat on a plastic chair, wearing plastic clothes, typing on a plastic laptop. Uh, like I said, my plastic surfboards, I've got a plastic lamp. Uh, so have test yourself and see how much of your life is actually influenced by plastic. Brilliant, awesome advice. And we've got Notre Dame who's wondering if you could speculate for a second for us. Imogen, do you think that there's more plastic on land or in the ocean total? I think there's more plastic on land, especially because of landfill sites. Uh, in a lot of countries, we've got a method to properly get rid of waste. And unfortunately, we do put a lot of it just buried in the ground or we can try and recycle it. But a scary amount does actually end up going into the ocean. And what we're trying to show from this Ganges trip, the sea to source expedition, is that rivers act as conveyor belts for plastic getting from land into the ocean. Um, so we really need to attack and focus on those hotspots to stop it getting in there in the first place. Awesome. Let's go to Amelia for our next question. Amelia's up on screen with us. Your microphone's on. Um, have, is there like a way that like we could not only stop using plastics, but you make the same stuff that's made out of plastic just as a different material. What material would that be? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we can use paper, we can use cardboard. I've seen uh, carrier bags being made out of fish scales. You can make items nearly out of anything. We just need some budding scientists in the room like you guys to test that in the future. But also plastic is actually a really great material. And I don't think in my lifetime, I'm ever gonna see it go away. Um, but it's how we think of it. Plastic was made to be so durable, like this water bottle. And Bakelite, the first synthetic plastic, its logo was an infinity symbol. because the person who invented it wanted it to last forever. So you'd only have to use that plastic once. The problem is, is when it's in a single use application, so we could have a carrier bag that's been built to last forever, but then we only use it for maybe 15 minutes. So there's a place for plastic and also new materials. So it'll be exciting to see where the future goes. Brilliant. And speaking of the future, how long into the future will plastic be here? Do you know how long it takes to fully break down? I've heard lots of people say, and I believe it too, that all of the plastic that's ever been made, every single bit, unless it's been burnt, is still on the planet today because it's been built to be so durable. Um, it might break down into tiny pieces, but those tiny pieces are gonna last in the environment for a really long time too. So in my personal opinion, I think it's thousands of years. Wow, that's a really long time. That's hard to imagine. Um, we've got Bubbles online who's wondering, it's a funny username, sorry, hi Bubbles. Um, Bubbles is wondering if it's expensive or difficult to make biodegradables and other alternatives. Why don't we see more of that? Hmm, I, I think it could be more expensive. 
Uh, and that, like I said, there's definitely a place for them. There's definitely a solution for them. But the problem is, is that they need to go into really specific waste management facilities. Um, like we were saying before, with a certain bacteria, or a certain temperature, or a certain pH. Um, oh, it just goes in the landfill on the environment, and it could just behave like a normal plastic. So we need to start progressing or thinking about different waste management streams so we can properly deal with the biodegradable plastics. Brilliant. And we've got Erica online who's wondering, Imogen, in your opinion, if they were going to pick one single use plastic item to focus on as a school and really, really double down and eliminate that one thing, is there something you'd recommend to make the largest impact on reducing their waste footprint? Hmm, I guess it depends where you are. I would say for me that what can make a really big change is having a water bottle. Uh, because if you can have access to clean water, then you can just keep refilling it in your water bottle. And you'll be surprised of how much plastic that you'll save. So I'd say water bottles and then my other pet hates is plastic cutlery. So if you can bring some cutlery, like some metal forks or knives from home, or some metal chopsticks or anything, rather than having those single use plastic forks all the time, it'll make a big difference. Brilliant. Um, we have so many people who are wondering about the micro beads from the face washes. Could you give us a couple more details about that? People are really interested in that experiment. Yeah, I think I might actually have one. I'm in my, okay, so this is a, a facial scrub that has microbeads in. So the microbeads are tiny plastic particles that were put into facial scrubs. You then wash it on your face and because it's so abrasive, it's really hard material, it'll take, help make our skin really smooth. So companies used to put all of these tiny plastic particles in a bottle. The problem is, is that they're plastic and they're so small we found that three million could be in one bottle that they'll get washed down the drain and then potentially into the ocean. And it's not needed because you can have natural alternatives instead, like you could put sugar or salt in a facial scrub instead. And because it was completely not necessary, that's why um, this became banned and companies went to natural alternatives instead. But if you're ever curious or you want to raid your bathroom, if you look on the back in the ingredients list, if it's got plastic in it, it will say polyethylene. Polyethylene, what a great like hidden villain to look out for. That could be a fun project for, the, for a rainy afternoon, going through and auditing your closet or your, your supply cabinets. Um, we've got Molly online who asked a really interesting question. Molly is wondering about making new items out of old plastic. Do you recommend that? And how long can you keep using the same plastic for for new things? That's a, a really good question. So you can make new plastic out of old plastic. Um, recycling it is effective, but there's part of me that thinks that we're just delaying the problem. And as well, it's often discussed that when you recycle something a few times, its quality deteriorates. So you can only recycle it maybe six times. That's just a, a random made up number. So we need to start looking at plastic like a wonder material and using it for life or for single use applications trying to get away from it. Brilliant. Let's go back to Samara for another question. Samara, your microphone is on. Oh, I don't have a question. All right. I love that. Um, in that case, let's go to Matthew. Matthew, your microphone is on as well. How much plastic is being captured and recycled now? Hmm. That's a really good question. I believe, and I can only speak for the UK, I think only 10% of plastic is recycled, which you think it would be a lot more. And that's because it's got so many problems with it because there's so many different types of plastic, uh, but recycling facilities can only deal with a certain few. So maybe even polyethylene and polypropylene, it can't do all of the wonderful types of plastic that we have. And then if plastic's dirty, if it hasn't been cleaned out, uh, recycling plants, recycling industries can't deal with it. So I would like to see there be a greater increase in recycling, but it's not as much as you would expect. 
Imogen, we've got Nico online who's wondering how many plastic, microplastics specifically, can come from a water bottle sized amount of plastic. Ooh. So, as in if a water bottle broke up? Oh, so it could go into microplastics, which are less than five millimeters, and then it can get even smaller. And then it can get into a class called nanoplastics, and that's plastics that you can't even see. So, I really think that millions of plastics tiny plastic bits could come off a water bottle. Ooh, that's a lot. That, ooh. Um, we've got some folks wondering what your favorite experiment to run is, Imogen? Hmm, uh, I've never been asked that before. Um, I love doing field work. So I love going out and collecting all of the samples because you meet some incredible people, you get to work with incredible teams and see some things that you don't always get to see. Um, but I do really like being next to a microscope and putting some good music on, looking down the microscope and then trying to extract all my tiny plastic fibers. It can be quite fun. Love it. Sinclair is wondering about how the plastic pollution issue varies by countries. So is there a country that you look to as a great example for plastic management? And is there one where there's a lot of opportunity to, to really improve plastic mitigation? I would say that all countries have a chance to improve um, and we should all learn from each other. Some are really good at waste management, some are really good at education. So we need to have a greater conversation all together on how we can try and pinch ideas and also collaborate to try and make the situation better. Um, but there's always room for improvement, that's what I would say. We've got a lot of crying faces and sea turtle emojis in the chat bar. Um, everybody's feeling pretty sad for the wildlife and the animals. Is there something that gives you hope, Imogen? Yeah, um, and it's people like you guys. And just in the last, oh gosh, five years, there's been a huge increase of how much people are discussing plastic and environmental matters and making small changes in their lifestyles that can have a huge impact for the ocean. So people refusing to buy facial scrubs with microbeads in, you're stopping three million tiny microbeads potentially entering the ocean. Only washing your clothes when you need to is stopping 700,000 fibers potentially entering the ocean. So it's really shown me how we are all ocean heroes and you just need to make small changes to make a huge difference. Amazing. Well, let's see if Amelia has another question. Amelia, your microphone's on. Go ahead and ask a question. Um, is, is there a way that we can just clean up the microplastics that are close by us? Is, if there's a way that we can clean up the ocean with plastics that's close by us? Yeah. So there's loads of different ways. Uh, one of my most favorite things to do, and it just reminds me of why I do the research, is doing beach cleans. And it might not seem like you're collecting a lot, but actually, if you're stopping a bottle from going in the ocean, like we said a minute ago, you could be stopping that bottle from breaking up into millions of plastic pieces. Uh, and even if you don't live by a river or the ocean, picking up litter in your town or your city or your countryside, that's still stopping plastic from getting in the environment. So what you can do and, and what I like to do is pick up the litter that you see, if it's safe and put it in the bin. Okay. Let's go to Daniel and Sarah for another question. Your microphone's on. Uh, well, I don't have a question, but I do have a commentary and that is that I have seen somewhere that there is like the marine birds of uh, the marine birds uh, in, in there's a lot of places that can be found like uh, dead because they have starved to death because they have been eating plastic so if you find them then caught up in their stomach you can see that they're full of plastic yeah this is really sad actually and uh, someone best described it to me before was how would you feel if you ate a plastic bag I don't think I'd feel very well at all um so that's why we need to do these little changes in our lifestyles so that the birds don't eat plastic. Unfortunately, they don't know not to eat it. They think it's food, but they won't feel very well afterwards. Oh yeah, and Imogen, um, as you know, it's t Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, is there a particular teacher that helped you get to where you are today that you'd like to give a shout out to? 
I would say my mum's my mum isn't a traditional teacher she's my mum uh, but she definitely taught me the ways of the world and she taught me to follow my passions and to research what I found interesting and to follow my dreams so I'd say that my teacher is my mum uh, I'm massively thankful to her. Amazing and do you have any general advice for the young explorers joining us today? So I'd say if you want to be a plastic detective and I'm sure you all are you have to remain curious ask questions and investigate. So cool. And for folks who have more questions than we have time to answer today, is there a place that they could get in touch online? Absolutely. Um, I've got a Twitter account, so it's just Imogen Napper and also Instagram. So please ask any questions and I'd be more than happy to answer. Brilliant. Well, for folks watching along at home, you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. We hope to see you all at our next events. Tomorrow, we have four awesome events. It's going to be a very busy day in the Explorer classroom. Um, at 11 a.m. Eastern time, we're taking a tour of a conservation station in Costa Rica with Andy Whitworth. At 1 p.m. Eastern, we have a pre-K through second grade event called Why Plants Matter with Maria Fadiman. At 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to learn about mapping Mount Everest with Alex Tate. And at 3.30 Eastern, we've got a high school event called Behind the Headlines with Tomasa Yuso. All of those will be great. I can't wait to see you all there. But for now, students, nice and loud, I'm going to turn on everybody's microphones. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Imogen. Ready? Bye. Bye. Bye.